Welcome to The Upshot, Multi-World Disc Golf's podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. I'm the editor, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me is Josh Mansfield. It's Wednesday, September 15th. I feel like we just did a pod, Josh. I, I know. I, after, after only seeing you once a week for like a month and a half, <laughs> uh, back-to-back is just too much, Charlie. <laughs> it's too much. It's too much. Well, maybe we can get together on Sunday and watch the Broncos and Bo Nix tear it up. Uh, yeah. What I do you sh- think? Oh. <laughs> Not like my 49ers are in great shape. I, I was going to say, listen, d- y- you are, you guys are just flooding the uh, emergency room over there with your injuries. Uh, so, gosh, I know. Um, hey, we got a we got a good one for you today. We're going to get you ready for GMC and the Disc Golf Pro Tour playoffs. The playoffs. You're so exclusive, Charlie. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Um, we're also going to have Chris Clark of DiscGolf.Law on to talk more about this Jonathan Ray situation, which uh, there's, there's a bunch of updates, uh, including the fact that it sounds like the tournament is going to happen. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll talk about if there's a, a criminal element here uh, and, and more later in the show. But we begin today with GMC and the Pro Tour playoffs. Um, we'll talk about GMC and it's nice you know we had worlds here last year and now we're back for the standard gmc it's such a spectacularly beautiful time of year in Mm -hmm. northern vermont like the fall colors are going to be just starting to turn and josh it just it's a nice tournament to watch on television it's it's a nice tournament to watch it it brings good competition it's got two different courses that have i think just an excellent skill set to be tested of risk reward accuracy uh shot shaping and line hitting it it is it is a dream tournament if you are a disc golf fan and but brewster is number five in the world according to udisc and fox run is number seven in the world according to udisc and i think they're like four and six or four and five in uh u.s courses yeah i think that's right well because the top three are all euro courses right right now Krokel, right. uh, Hainola, and Ale. So bumps them up uh, in the U.S. But man, they're just what a spectacular property to watch disc golf on. And it, it, this is one that I think is like the golf and the competition side is equally as good as the spectating experience at home. And so it, it's one that make sure you've got your 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 disc golf network subscription. Uh, we've got a couple of really important tournaments on the slate, and and this is definitely the one that you want to start watching and, and enjoy live. When's a when's a Pro Tour Championship? October. Well, I know that seventeenth to twentieth. Okay. okay. So if you're really looking for that bang for your buck, you sign up September. I don't on know. Saturday or twenty first. Yeah. So watch right? Saturday, Sunday. So you you you. You get the first round free on YouTube, right? Yep. Go ahead, skip round two, because yep. who really needs to watch round two? <laughs> you sign up on Saturday, and then boom, you're going to get GMC, M- MVP at Maple Hill, mm-hmm. USDGC, and the Pro Tour Championship in full for a one month subscription. It's probably the best that's, spot in the calendar. That's that, that might to be get the your best subscription. Spot. Yeah. Uh, make sure to check what level of subscription you need to access like USDGC. It might be behind like the pro subscription. They probably haven't announced that yet. Uh, that's probably true. Take a look. Make sure to look. But sign up Saturday. That's that is here. Here we are. We're giving you all the, the tricks to get the most out of your money. Um, all right. So we'll, we'll talk about GMC and the courses and uh, past winners and all that in a sec. But let's first take a look at what the heck the playoffs are all about just in case you're not familiar. Now, to call these playoffs is a little bit of a stretch. It's a because joke. It's like, here's, here's what it is. These events, GMC and MVP, are worth a lot of points, and yep. you can't drop them. So if you're at the bubble and you want to make the Tour Championship, these are extremely important events. Yes. Okay. The cutoff is 32 for MPO, and is it? 20. 24 now i think it's it's 20 it's 20 still it's 20 it's 20. 20 yeah so and that is 20 in fpo for the tour championship right now not only do you guarantee yourself a bunch of money by making the tour championship but you also get a two-year tour card exemption so you get 
guaranteed to Ricard for the next two seasons. Um, so if like if you're one of those borderline players, it could be really beneficial to get in and, and that exclusive of the money part of it. Right. Um, so those we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the bubble and who could get in. But keep in mind, these tournaments are worth 150 percent of a standard. So 50 percent bonus, uh, which means that you can have some real leaderboard swings. Like if, if you're in the 30s in MPO or you're in the 20s in FPO and you finish in the top 10, you're going to have a really good chance of walking up a tour championship spot. So that's what makes these important. Now, the fact that this we call them a playoff, like it's a bit of a stretch because right now the top 100 MPO and top 50 FPO get into GMC. I think the standings cutoff was after Idlewild um, for GMC. Then they cut it down to 80 and 40 for MVP. But then, of course, the cutoff for the tournament for the Tour Championship is 32 and 20. So, like, realistically, the players who make it into MVP who are in the 70s and 80s, or, or I should say 60s and 70s, like they have no chance of making the tour championship. Like I guess, no. Good for no. you, you you got a chance to get in and play at a great course. Sure, but sure. It, it, the, the the cut lines are not aggressive enough, and I've I've been complaining about this for years now. Yep. Uh, uh for reference, the 80th place right now is Nico, and Nico sits at 129.9 points, 130 points. If Nico were to win both of these events, he might get in. Eagles well, you win, if you win, you automatically in. Well, sure, 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 sure. Okay, but on so, a points basis. But on a points let's basis. Say he finished, let's say he finished second. second at both of them. Second how, at how both. How many points would he get? He'd get like... 135, I think? 132? That sounds right. Well, I let's just look at the, Waco. Because, uh, oh, they only get 100. Well, that's Elite Plus. And those are only worth 125. Uh, so... Let's say it's maybe. like 130 then. I mean, let's I'm sure we could look it up exactly, but... The, so give him a 260-point bonus for his uh, current standings. Where would he land? Uh, so 260 points. That would put him at 390. He still does not catch Eagle. Wow. So he, he, the only way anybody that far down has any chance of getting in is, is they have to Is win. with a win. Yes, correct. Yeah. Correct. So I don't know. Like, I get it. They want to have these events still have a lot of participants. Because it's entry fees, a and, lot of work to make up that money. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah, so I get that, but like, it just makes it feel. I, I wish there was more ways for these to matter more. Yeah, either like getting in is like a benefit more to players. Um, like maybe you should get some sort of payout just for getting into these tournaments. Sure. Or, uh, uh if you make it into the playoffs, you get a one-year tour card exemption. Right, but but make the cut like top sixty get into GMC and top like forty. Well, that's the obvious thing to do. Forty five would be would be to tighten up the the cut lines and actually make it meaningful to get into these tournaments. Correct, and and then cut down the field progressively, which is what they do for the FedEx Cup in golf. Anyway, they're still great tournaments, and it's fine. It's just like the idea that they're somehow playoffs is sort of misleading. Yeah. The the events matter for the people who are within about ten spots of the of the bubble, basically. Right. And and of course, you always have the chance that you could win and just lock up a spot automatically. Um. So let's talk about the bubble, Josh. Okay. We have in the current standings. We'll start in FPO. Uh, Hannah Win is first out, twenty first place, six points behind Stacy Kiefer, who's on the bubble. And th- there's a big like the top nineteen are pretty far in front of 20 and below and charlie one other note you have to go up to top 18 because emily weatherman has an invite due to her win you don't though because they change the rules okay oh because they don't they don't if you make the top 20 you're good yes they don't they don't slide it up to 19 or or whatever right so it it, if you make the top 20 you're good um even if people outside of the top 20 have won a tournament and locked up an auto spot so my point is that so okay so even if emily weatherman falls out that doesn't matter it doesn't matter got it correct correct 
So you've got Stacey Kiefer at 572 points, Hannah Wynn effectively tied at 566, Ellie Mittling at 550, and then a drop off down to Rachel Turton, who's sitting at 507 points. I don't know if Turton is coming over for these tournaments. Uh, Stacey Ronsley at 487, still certainly within striking distance. Um, Holly Finley at 461, and then I, I don't really know if it's past Raven Klein at 459. I mean, there's a bunch of players in the 450s. If they had two great tournaments back to back, they could get in. They could get in. Yeah. So, but it really feels like you've only got one spot available. Yes. Right. That's because that's Emily Weatherman is at 658, like. 100 points, points in ahead. front of Stacy Kiefer and 100 points uh, more than 100 points above Ellie Midling. Uh, you know, right. Anna, Hannah wins almost at the 100 mark. So uh, I just I mean, it, it is theoretically possible. But it feels like there is only one spot left in FPO and Stacy Kiefer holds it right now, but it is very close down into the 450. Yes. Um, so. That's kind of what you're looking at. I think particularly Hannah Wynn, Ellie Mittling, Stacey Kiefer, that feels like the trio that's really going to be battling yep. for those spots. Are they all registered? Kiefer, Wynn, Mittling. Let's check. Stacey Kiefer is playing. Mittling is playing. Hannah Wynn is playing. So all right. love to see it. I'm sure that they'll do some focus on those players in the broadcast. That They should. Good. Um. Okay, so how about on the MPO side? Let's take a look at the cutoff. Josh, what 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 yeah. do you see in here? Eagles got Eagles got last in right now in thirty second. Um, which impressive. He's fine, Josh. Like, yeah, he's coming off of third and eighth place finishes. Correct. This he's, is he should move up. This is him not playing for the first, you know, eight tournaments of the season. Uh, you expect Eagle to to move up, and he's at four twelve. So Eagle feels like he's going to be locked in, especially given how well he's played these events in the past. Uh, then you're looking. Uh, let's say, let's talk about everybody who is like four fifty ish and below. Casey White comes in at four fifty. Luke Humphreys four thirty two. Mason Ford four fifteen. Emerson Key four fourteen. Evan Smith is four twelve. And then Eagle at four twelve. Eagle at four twelve. And that's so, that's the that's the top thirty two right there. Yep. Those are six spots of players who sit at 450 or worse. In and I think the, basically maybe all the way up to like 500, it feels like those players are okay. at least susceptible of dropping out if they play bad, right? Right. Well, I don't know. Is Cole Dolan registered? Cole Dolan sits at 465. Um, does he have a win this season? No, he does not. Radolin is not playing. Rodolin is not playing. So Rodolin, who sits at 465, is definitely susceptible. Uh, let's just hit your top 12, or I guess your bottom 12, your 21st through 32nd spot. Andrew Marweed is the top of that pack at 499. Uh, Luke Taylor, 475. Joel Freeman, 474. Cole Rodolin, 465. Robert Burridge, 461. And Vino Makala, 455. Then the list that was previously mentioned. So, so you've really got a, a group of people who have a chance. And and I think you probably go down to what the three hundred mark, probably. So that Ezra Aderhold is first out at four hundred and five. Paul is Ulibarri at four hundred is not playing, correct? Yeah, Yuli is not playing. It's a bummer. So Yuli is going to be outside looking in on this, and he's only going to drop. I, I think uh, it's I think it's a really tough ask, even if he could get back for MVP at this point for him to qualify. Yeah, you really need to be playing both of these. And what's 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 too bad about it is that I think he would have easily qualified without the missing all this time. Yeah, yep. I mean he's Missed a lot. Of he's like having a historic putting season. Yeah, but the uh, the missed time is just going to be too much to overcome, especially missing this event. Like he probably could have gotten in even with this event. Yeah, if he'd played these two events, that probably would have been enough. Uh, ben Calloway, 399. Jake Hebenheimer, 386. Matt Bell, 370. Bradley Williams, 364. Then you have the dro- a bit of a drop to Garrett Gerthy at 335. Uh, Yuna Heinenen, I don't know if he's coming over. 324. Austin Turner, 310. Kev Jones, 305. Uh, Jesse Niemannen at 301. And James Conrad, 299. There you go. Yeah, uh, I don't think... Um... 
I don't think Heinonen is playing. Okay. So count him out. But I think basically the rest of the of this group is playing. Uh, I mean Ezra is the obvious one who I think makes it in. I I kind of like Kevin Jones's chance chances of making a push here. Uh, he's won at GMC before, won in twenty twenty. Feels like he's been playing better too. He's been playing better since the sponsorship switch. Now he is a hundred points back, so he's gonna have to put together some decent performances. But uh, like, he's kind of he's kind of my dark horse to maybe sneak in, uh, especially if you've got like Cole Riddell and not playing. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you think about some of the people who are kind of gonna fall out, right? Cole Riddell's probably falling out, right? Um, unless he plays MVP, and then maybe Luke Humphreys feels like he's just white knuckles holding on. Yeah, you know he got the top ten at um, Idlewild. That yeah, helped. but uh, that did help. But his finishes since preserve go fortieth, thirty third, forty second, one hundred fifth, thirtieth, fifty first. Yeah, the, and a it, lot it of them feels are very similar to like. Was it two years ago or last yeah, year when Luke whatever, like started the first out great? Time he po- when he, yeah, and then slowly slid down, 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 and you know, I think it's th- this. What's kind of fun about these last couple events is that like, play well, you're in. Play don't play well, bye bye. Yep. So, uh, all these guys thing, are capable. One other thing that we should talk about real quick. Uh, Gannon Burr has a hundred and thirty ish points on Ricky right now. And remember that this year, the stroke advantage does not get reset after round two. So holding on to that first place will give Gannon 10 strokes under par to begin the pro tour championship. Both of these events are going to count because that's the problem that Gannon's been struggling with. And a little bit of the reason why Ricky's been able to kind of catch up is that, you know, he's gotten some, well, I guess he hasn't even caught up that much, but uh, Gannon has dropped some really good scores because of how well he's played this season. So these two events are going to count for him. I think this is an opportunity for Gannon to create a little bit of separation, uh, especially this weekend. Yeah. I, I mean, keep in mind, right? The difference between finishing first and second in the pro tour standings is only a stroke. And that's true. But I also think that it says something to, to, to be the best player in the, the season. Points. Uh, well, and, Ricky sure thinks so. so. But before we move off to Gannon point, I mean, first of all, you know, what a season he's having. And Josiah in the Ulti World Disc Golf Discord posted a little comparison between Gannon's season here in 2024 and Calvin's season from 2023. Let's take a look. We'll put it up on the screen for the YouTube folks. Um, to this point in the season, equivalent number of starts at Elite and majors, 20. Uh, they both have had, they both top 10 to 19 times. Uh, Calvin with an incredible 12 top threes to Gannon's nine. But Gannon has six that, wins to Calvin's two, including a major win. Um, has placed better at the majors on average. Better overall average event rating at 1052 this season compared to Calvin's 1050 last year. But Calvin. Better both mean and median finish than Gannon, uh, which shows you just how amazingly consistent he was a season ago. But what I, I don't think it's a contest. G- Gannon's season still significantly better with the six wins, Josh. And and we're not done yet. That's right. We have four more events. Right. Like get this this whole like twelve top threes. Gannon could overtake that. G- That's true. Gannon, not only could he tie it, he could outright o- overtake that if he podiums out for the rest of this year, which is not a crazy feat to believe that could happen. He's definitely going to pass him in top tens. I have no doubt about that. Uh, and now, Grant, I guess this is through 20 elite series and major yeah, starts. Yeah, it li- so becomes apples it, to oranges slightly. You're right. You're right. I didn't. Uh, and that so that that is fair. Um, but th- like I, I would not be shocked if Gannon is able to improve upon his averages as he goes. Um, and the the six wins just obviously puts yeah. Gannon's just over the top. 
G- Gannon Gannon is having a super season, and it yes. could become historic. Yep, if he plays great down the stretch with with the four tournaments left. Yes, with four tournaments left. Um, just thought that was interesting. Figured it was worth a mention. Um, so yeah, again, players jockeying uh, for that starting stroke advantage. Now they're going to play a four round tournament. No resets. You, they're they're going the golf route. Basically, love it. Love it. So, so it's simple. It's clear. The, the if first place finisher in the standings in the regular season ends up with a ten stroke, uh, starting ten under par for their event. Second place nine down. Third place eight down. Fourth place seven down, and then it scales down from there over the all the way down to uh, 29th to thirty second in MPO, getting no. They start even. So, you know, good luck. But like you're being like very clearly rewarded for playing well during the year. We'll see how it goes on the ground. But like, you know, to ask players who are in the middle of the pack to make up a five stroke deficit you know, over four rounds, it's not it, you could still have a big surprise, even That's if it, this makes it less likely. A stroke, essentially a stroke around. Absolutely possible. A- and listen, here's the other thing. I while there is excitement in players like Nathan Queen winning the Disc Golf Pro Tour Championship. Uh, with the amount of money that's on the line and like what it's supposed to represent, it just like Gannon winning it because he has 10 strokes might be, you know, he may run away with it and he may go into the final round with a 10 stroke lead. And and that might be boring, right? But at the end of the day, it also feels correct, right? Yeah, like it he makes earned sense. It. He earned it. He did. Right. This and, is supposed to be your bonus. Yes. Yes. And I I do like now that that rewards it. I don't know if I would have said that a while ago, but I think my attitude on this has changed uh, to to just really preferring this straightforward, yeah. clear cut reward. I'm I'm, I'm going to be curious to see how it feels like it plays out in the actual course. Because if it is like blowout fest after two rounds, we might we might be like, eh. <laughs> but we'll see, we'll see. Um. Similar situation in, in FPO, obviously, the uh, scaling down of, of strokes is different because it's a smaller field. Sure. So that's the basics of the playoffs. One more thing, Josh. What do you got? Yeah, I want to give you one more thing. Okay. Kristen Tatar, uh, who is not in the lead in the Disc Golf Pro Tour standings right now. Uh, she's fourth. She's fourth. Behind Hall and Missy and Owen. Yes. If she were to get another win, this is coming from Justin Westfall's uh, preview article on GMC. She were to get another win, which could be GMC, could be, uh, you know, Maple Hill. She would tie her elite and major win total or her elite series win total from each of the last two seasons. <laughs> it's impressive. A ton of time. She's not performed quite to the same level. That's for sure. But the fact that she could still reach that point, like she could end up in the first place in the disc golf pro tour standing still with strong yeah. performances. I, I, I feel like we've seen Kristen look a little shaky and then lock in mm-hmm. last year. It happened a bunch. Now the, the shaky play was a, a round, right? Not months. Now it's th- or, or multiple or rounds, multiple and only rounds one's per good. tournament. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, I definitely don't count it out. I Correct. think she's still the world number one, um, but I, as as we discussed last week, you know, it feels a little bit more like Kristen is one of a group of players who could win on any given week rather than being the clear and dominant favorite going into an event. Now, going into this particular event, I think there's a great case to say that Kristen's still the odds on favorite. Yep. Right. Because yep. she won worlds here last year. She's been she's won this GMC in the past. She plays great on these courses. Yep. There's no reason that she can't go out here and reassert herself. Um, but you know we got to see it. That is definitely the case. It'll be interesting. It's it's an interesting storyline as we come down the end of the season. Brewster Ridge Fox Run. Uh, we know these courses very well. There's not a whole lot of changes to speak of. They tightened up some of the OB at Fox. They changed hole one's OB to be a little bit 
friendlier around the green um, <laughs> on Fox Run. <laughs> and uh, Brewster's basically unchanged. What's interesting about these courses, Josh, is that they are very short. Mm -hmm. um, Fox Run, while, you know, kind of like a classic, lots of OB, skinny fairways type of yep. course, is not long. It's not super stretched out. It's not an Ivy Hill. It's not mm -hmm. an OTB. Um, it is very manageable for moderate power players, which is why I think we've seen a lot of diversity in the leaderboards here. Uh, you know, obviously, Wood Specialist getting half the rounds at Brewster means that they can put themselves in a good position. You know, Isaac Robinson is going to be maybe the favorite this weekend yep. is that crazy to say no i, I don't i so. don't know if gannon's the favorite i really don't know despite the fact that he's playing great he's been the best player this season he's, he's played fine here in the past but like this is a course where isaac or a pair of courses i should say where isaac we know he can shred and like the more moderate distance means that the kind of the biggest arms don't have that outsized advantage that they typically have i also think that when you look at fox run uh, a lot of the holes that like, you don't need a forehand in order to execute them. Um, and, and so the two things that, that Gannon clearly has over Isaac is Gannon can throw further and Gannon's got a better forehand. Both of those things just aren't as important on these courses. And while, you know, having the forehand will always give Gannon a, a boost. Isaac is one last year and was in a, a tie for second place in 2022. Uh, to me, it feels very equal. Like I, I don't, I don't know if I elevate Isaac enough above Gannon, but like if you said that they had equal odds, uh, you know, if I were to bet and they were tied for the win and best favorite, I, I that would make sense to me. And I think that fits. But you've also got Ricky Waisaki, who won in 2022. And then also, if you go back to the days in uh, just before when it was just eight years and and the first um, uh, year of it of being on the disc golf pro tour, Ricky had a five or four years in a row that he won from 2013 to 2016. So Ricky loves these courses, plays great on them. And, and so it really feels like you've got three guys who might be coming in with kind of equal odds to win. And I don't know if any of them are a clear favorite to win it out this week. So uh, Brewster will be played rounds one and three. Fox run rounds two and four. And uh, it'll be a nice return to the 2023 World's Venue. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be joined by Chris Clark to talk more about this Masters at Bud Hill, Jonathan Ray situation, as well as make our picks. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. Go check out the brand new custom Vagabond pack builder. You want a shoulder carry bag? They've got you and so if you're looking for something even smaller than a Rufus, get yourself a Vagabond and you don't have to rush. You don't have to be the first one to click. Stock Vagabonds, second drop already sold out, but you can go get a custom pack built. You can get add-ons like a side pocket Velcro or an optional insulated insert. And you can customize the fabric, the zippers, the sliders, the cord, the webbing, the patch, all of it. So go to pounddiscgolf.com, check out the custom pack builders for any of your bag desires and get yourself the best bag in the sport. Why spend more of your hard-earned money when you can get affordable, high-quality CBD straight from the farm? Today's show is sponsored by Sunset Lake CBD, a Vermont hemp farm creating CBD products designed to help you relax and decompress at the end of the day. They've got everything you need to kick back, available on their website. Smokables, edibles, hemp-derived THC, coffee, and even CBD for your pets. The best part is that Sunset Lake CBD will ship it directly from their farm to your door. That means fewer trips to the store and more time for relaxing and doing what you enjoy. I know for sure that I enjoyed the sleep gummies when I was traveling to and from Australia. I used them. They got the melatonin in them plus the CBD. Really helped me avoid the jet lag. So when I was on the plane and I needed to sleep, I would take one. When I got there, first couple days, I would take one. You know, I try not to take melatonin every day, but when you need to get some high quality sleep, especially if you're traveling across time zones, it's the best. So check it out. You can save 20% on your order. Go to sunsetlakecbd.com. Use code UPSHOT at checkout. And you can save 20% Sunset Lake CBD, farmer-owned, Vermont-grown. Welcome back to the UPSHOT. 
Joining us now is Chris Clark of DiscGolf.Law back on the program to talk about this Jonathan Ray situation. A lot of money coming in and then poof, tournament not going to happen. But but the tournament now is in fact going to happen. Uh, Tyler Cyril is going to be running it and uh, they said they're going to offer refunds. Seth Fenley got involved. Both of those gentlemen were on the uh, Smashbox podcast last night with Terry Miller and JVD. Um, and so, you know, Seth Fenley, now the CEO of uh, sort of North American operations for House of Discs. And they got involved because Dynamic Discs was kind of name dropped initially. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Chris, uh, welcome back. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, Charlie, Josh, thanks a lot for having me back on the program. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about this online. We've seen uh, people are very upset and understandably so. Uh, you know, $150 entry fee. And then we get this post from from Jonathan Ray that actually tournament's not going to happen. I'm filing for bankruptcy. Um, I've had a really hard year. I use the funds throughout the season. And then normally I refill the coffers before this tournament. Uh, but this year that didn't work out and uh, also posted a little bit about some medical issues that he had been having. And so there's a lot, been a lot of speculation about, uh, you know, what what exactly is the deal here? Is this embezzlement? Is this a crime? Uh, is this just a failed business situation? Chris, I'm hoping you can shed some light on how this might be looked at if it were to go to court. Well. I feel like when issues like this come up, I say the same thing over and over again, which is it's going to vary from state to state what laws would apply in this situation. And obviously, in a situation like this, we have a question of whether it is embezzlement, which is a crime that would be a criminal, uh, a criminal charge, or might there be some form of civil liability um, in a situation like this? I think both are possible. Let's start with embezzlement because like you, that is what I have seen the most online is people saying things like this is a clear case of embezzlement, um, something like that. I'm not sure it's a clear case of embezzlement and I'll tell you why. Intent is an element of embezzlement. So in order for the crime of embezzlement to be successfully proven in court, you must prove that the defendant had the intent to deprive people of, of their money. And so I think most of the other elements of embezzlement have been met. But I think there may be a proof problem with this intent element. And the reason I say that is because Jonathan Ray has been extremely, perhaps overly transparent um, with his social media posts about this issue. And he has described a scenario that I think seems plausible to me, which is just that his financial situation uh, got away from him. And um, this was more perhaps something rooted in negligence rather than intent. So to start off by answering your first question, embezzlement, I think probably not. There are other charges that, you know, in terms of criminal charges that might be more appropriate um, than embezzlement, uh, theft, conversion, negligent misappropriation, things like that. Um, but so from the criminal side, that's, that's, that's my take on it. And I'll say one more thing real quick about the criminal side of things. I assume that this would be something that would be handled under Tennessee law. I could be wrong about that, but just because that's the location of the tournament, um, it, it would have to be a pretty slow crime day in Memphis, in my opinion, for the police or the district attorney's office to take much interest in a situation like this, especially if Jonathan Ray doesn't have a history of financial crimes or something like that. 
so so what about on the civil side then? What what are the options? Because in individually, one hundred and fifty dollars seems like not a lot to get an attorney and go to like a small claims court, for example. But when you look at it in the collective, total amount of registrants and and money was, you know, near thirty thousand dollars. So so what does that civil side look like then, if not criminal? So realistically. $150 is a very difficult amount of money to seek some type of recovery through legal channels. And frankly, $30,000 is a difficult amount to seek some type of recovery through legal channels. Um, what further complicates this issue is it, if, if Jonathan Ray is to be believed, and I don't know him at all, but the people that I know who know him have described him as trustworthy and upstanding guy until this situation happened. Um, so um, it sounds like it is unlikely he has any money or assets or resources with which to pay a judgment. So if somehow someone could get a $30,000 judgment against him in court, it probably wouldn't be worth very much because if he doesn't have any money or assets, you're just not going to be able to get your money back. So it, it is a difficult decision. I guess the best answer to your question, Josh, would be, you know, they could it's it, in in most states that I'm familiar with. It's pretty easy to without the assistance of attorney file a claim in small claims court. So if someone felt inclined to do that, they could. It's problematic if the tournament's in one state and Jonathan Ray's in another state and the plaintiff who lost their $150 is in a third state, it becomes somewhat complicated. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I think this is just one of those situations where the amount of money that is in controversy doesn't justify civil legal action, unfortunately. So if Jonathan used the money well, so I, th there's, a, there's a bunch of like sort of like subtopic questions here, and I'll, I'll try to summarize kind of what my question is uh, overall. Assuming that he's using essentially a sole proprietorship structure, which I'm making an assumption, but based on the post and just sort of like the freewheeling nature of how this money seemed to have been used, maybe isn't a reasonable, is a reasonable assumption. Um, if, he in t if he gets the money at the beginning of the year, right, as people sign up for the tournament, and he's intending to run the tournament, but he's using the money to do other things like buy discs or even perhaps use the money for his own life purposes, like going to the do doctor. We, I, I would say at this point, it's not clear whether the money was used for personal use versus like a business operational use for disc golf events. But let's say that he did, right? He did use it for personal use, but he was intending to run the tournament. Is this criminal? Because it, it seems to me that under my understanding of sole proprietorship laws, like the money comes into your personal bank account. You can do whatever you want with it. Now, if he intended to steal the money, then obviously you have a case for embezzlement. But if he didn't and he just had a bad year and he just didn't make as much money as he expected, is this actual criminal wrongdoing or did he just make a big mistake? So, Does that make sense? Yes. And I think I hear two questions there. One would be, has a crime been committed. And the other would be if people paid their registration fees early in the year and he took that money and used it for something other than expenses related to this tournament, is that right. wrong or criminal or bad? Um, right. So uh, I think it's likely the elements of some crime have been met here. So I think he probably, if, if, if a if a police force and a, and a district attorney's office were so inclined, they could probably get some type of criminal charges to stick to him. But your point, I think that a lot of people don't realize and maybe aren't thinking about is well made, which is he could take all that money. He, he could take all that registration money with one caveat. I am not intimately familiar with the rules that the PDGA imposes on tournament directors. So let's set that aside for a minute. But the question that you asked, they could pay all their registration money early in the year and he could take it, take that money and go on a vacation in the Caribbean if he wants to, as long as he delivers what he legally promised to deliver, what the right. 
registrants paid for, their players pack and the ability to participate in this tournament. As long as he delivers that, then no, there's not anything wrong with him taking those funds and using them for something other than tournament expenses. And if another, we have someone who's stepping in to run this tournament, then that should fulfill that obligation. And and those people realistically have, have gotten what they paid for. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, Jonathan Ray has, I think, in at least two social media posts that I have seen, still pledged to refund the money of anyone who wants that money back. Now, he also claims he's going through bankruptcy. It's obvious that he's in financial difficulty. There may be some medical problems. If if you are a person who has never gone through financial hardship or difficulty, good for you. That's that's great. I think it would be helpful if we all keep in mind that this happens to people from time to time. Tournament directors don't tournament direct to get rich. They are typically overworked and underpaid, at least the tournament directors that I know and that I'm familiar with. So, um, you know, I I think um, I. I, I just I just stand by my statement. I just think it. I, I think I think looking to recover from him under those circumstances, especially now that the tournament looks like it's going to happen, it looks like people are going to get what they paid for, and there's even a possibility or maybe even a likelihood that people who have asked for their registration money back will get it. Um, I, I think you're right. I, I think. Probably, if if those things happen, it would be unlikely even for any criminal charges to to be appropriate here. Um, what is the PDGA's liability in all of this? I think the PDGA has kind of been through back channels a little bit, uh, making it clear that they were not going to backstop this event, that they were not going to step in and pay the money out. But they are donating, I think, discs and maybe other. Uh, merchandise or something like that to help this tournament happen and maybe like recover some of the money through like sales of product um, that have been donated by the PDGA. So clearly they feel like they want to get involved in some way, but they don't want to, you know, create a moral hazard situation where they're bailing out a TD who steals the money, um, which obviously then you open up the floodgates potentially of people doing this in the future. Uh, So like, it's a PDGA sanctioned event. Like how much of this do you feel like reflects on the PDGA? And I assume there's no legal basis for them to have to step in and get involved in any way, but clearly they are at least feeling a need to do something. I, I, I think you're right. I think it's very unlikely that any type of legal liability could attach to the PDGA from this situation. And for, for a couple reasons, the main one being you have to have some basis uh, for the PDGA to incur financial liability. And in this situation, the argument would need to go something like, hey, PDGA, you were negligent when you allowed this guy to run this tournament and to take our money and to be entrusted with all of these funds. And uh, so, so in other words, you know, PDGA, you really dropped the ball by letting this guy be a tournament director and collect these funds. Well, Jonathan Ray has a history of being a successful and by most people's accounts, trustworthy tournament director. So I think it'd be very difficult to argue that the PDGA was somehow negligent in allowing him to be the TD of the 2024 version of this tournament. Um, so so I just I, I I don't see a path for recovery through the PDGA. I, th- I think there are practical reasons why the PDGA wouldn't want to step in, which you described very well. But regardless of what the PDGA wants to do or should or shouldn't do, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's there's legal recourse through the PDGA. And, and let me answer one question that you didn't ask that I've seen a lot of people asking online, which is essentially the same question relevant to dynamic discs. And you may have been going to follow up with that. But I, I, while it's at the front of my mind, I figured I would just mention it. I, I don't think there's any avenue for recovery or liability for dynamic discs either. My understanding is that despite the fact that Jonathan Ray has a dynamic discs email address and 
signs his email messages and social media posts with dynamic disks down in the signature area. He, he is not and never has been an employee of dynamic disks. He is an independent uh, representative. He's worked with them for a long time. But here again, I just don't think there's any way that one could prove or even justifiably allege that Dynamic Disk somehow was negligent in entrusting Jonathan Ray to be a representative of theirs. Obviously, Jonathan made some huge mistakes and relied, as we've seen in the industry, uh, too much on rosy growth um, and projections on, you know, tournament uh, interest and sales of of discs uh, to kind of make his own internal financial projections, which turned out to be very wrong. And then it seems like he continued to dig his own grave further rather than like try to get out of it and and start to to build back up to be able to run this tournament. Um, I'm sure there will be some sort of sanctions coming from the PDGA against him. Maybe he's barred from tournament directing for a year, for five years, maybe for life. Uh, obviously, a lot of people are probably going to be distrustful of any events he runs in the future. So there's going to be repercussions for him, even if they don't come through legal avenues. Um, is there? I, I don't know if I have a specific question here. More just that, uh, you know, it seems like people are really out for like him to to go to jail, um, even though that it just doesn't seem like that's going to happen. But the reputational damage is going to be there, whether or not anything happens on the legal evidence. Well, I, I do have a response to that. It is possible that Jonathan Ray has fooled everyone for the last decade or so, and he's really a bad guy and that he was out to come and steal all these people's money. That uh, It's theoretically possible. The context clues and things that I've learned and others have learned suggest to me that that's not likely the case. It's more likely that and so so for the purpose of me responding to what you said, let's just assume that this is a guy who you know loves disc golf and and you know it's a labor of love for him to run these tournaments. He has had financial difficulty like many disc golf related businesses and individuals have. He has some health issues going on. I feel if you take all of this information that we have and you analyze it objectively, my response, and this is coming from a lawyer, is not to go to a legal action mindset, but to perceive this as someone who has essentially fallen on hard times and maybe made some bad decisions but also maybe didn't have a lot of other options available to him and just to to offer him some grace. I think he should face consequences, certainly from the PDGA. I would be shocked if he ever ran a tournament again. Um, given what he's going through, that might be okay with him. Who knows? Um, so so I, I guess what I'm trying to say in response to what you said is I feel like he has faced and is continuing to face negative consequences and experiences in his life. And this idea that, oh, and also he should have to go to jail and get a criminal record and all these kind of things. It's just, I, I, I don't understand that mindset for this situation. Let me ask you one last question. Um, the, the, there's a lot of what feels like extenuating circumstances here because of the multiple tournaments that were being run, the medical issues, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Let's just imagine a, a, a person who wants to run a single tournament, though. They've purchased the players packs that, you know, they're going to be spending a lot of that registration money in advance, securing park reservations, uh, vendors, bathrooms, et cetera, right? Like a lot of that money might get spent. Let's say a circumstance, you know, there's a real possibility that something outside of their control cancels that event. Uh, you know, a, a natural disaster happens and just kind of ruins that park and they can't host the event and, and all this money's already been spent. What would you recommend for tournament directors to kind of protect themselves legally and financially 
in, in cases of extenuating circumstances outside of their own control? Boy, that's a great question. And that's one I didn't anticipate you asking. <laughs> I'm not sure I've got a real good answer for it. Um, you know, I, I got I, I got criticized online in, in a few other um, on a few other occasions for suggesting that tournament registration fees should actually be higher so that tournament directors so that it would be worth a tournament director's time and effort. We want the brightest and best tournament directors we can have. And the way mm -hmm. that you get the brightest and best people to do something is you compensate them fairly for doing it. Um, so so I think my answer, I, I might have one answer given the reality of where we are today, and I might have a different answer if being a tournament director was actually a profitable undertaking. Uh, because... I, I think if if there's the possibility for more upside, you should be willing to take on more risk. Um, so what what in, in today's climate, what should a tournament director do to avoid all those things? I'm 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 not sure I got a good answer. Sorry. All right. I think there's options out there. One is like I feel like tournament directors should open an LLC or have some sort of business structure for their their tournament operations if they want to take salary from that they should be paid whether that's through a pass through entity like an LLC or if they set up a C corp and they pay themselves as an employee those are both options to create literal liability around the company and not just your personal self so you can bankrupt your company without bankrupting yourself um and there's also options if you want to remain a contractor to maybe get like a bond or something like that, where you're basically gar going to be backstopped, guaranteed by a third party, so that you know players know, hey, I'm not going to be screwed out of my money. If there's a money problem, I'll get my money back, and then the bonding company will deal with the tournament director. Um, and I honestly wonder if the PDGA will consider strengthening the rules around how tournament directors who are running A tiers and up, for instance, right. um, are set up from a from a business structure standpoint. In order to make sure something like this doesn't happen again, or at least it becomes a lot less likely. Okay, so uh, two things in response to that, real quick. Um, one, uh, setting up LLCs, corporations, business structures. Chris at discgolf.law. Um, second thing, um, <laughs> <laughs> even if even if Jonathan Ray had had a an LLC or a corporation and been conducting this business through an LLC, it Likely, and this is a misunderstanding that a lot of people have. A lot of people think oh, I'm going to have an LLC so that I can never be personally liable for anything. It, it, that's not what LLCs do or how LLCs or corporations work. It's likely that he still would have faced personal liability. It's likely that the the limited liability shield of an LLC or a corporation would not have necessarily protected him in this situation. Now, in the situation, the hypothetical, like what you and Josh were asking about, it very well, it very well could. And and I also think I think bond, a bond or an insurance, some type of event cancellation insurance or something like that, also probably good ideas. I'm, I'm I don't know much about insurance and bonds, so that didn't come to mind, but it seems like a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I haven't looked into it deeply either, but. Uh, Theoretically, that's something that could happen. Yes. Anyway, Chris, we appreciate your time as always. Thanks for joining us today. Congratulations to Disc Golf Law clients Sophia Donica and Thomas Gilbert for <laughs> winning Canadian Nationals. And thank you, Charlie yes. and Josh, for having me on. It's enjoyable to talk to you guys as always. Always. Thanks, Chris. Take care. Thank you. All right. So to wrap up today, it's just going to be me. Josh had to jet for work after our interview with Chris. Um, so I've got his picks and I will lay those out for you right now for GMC. And uh, I want to say thanks again to Chris for joining us. Always great to get uh, some legal perspective on the show. So here we go. Picks time. Uh, last year, GMC didn't happen because we had Worlds. So it was a five rounder. And then GMC happened in 2022. Uh, that year, your winners, uh, of course, last year, winners at the World Championships, Kristen and Isaac. 
uh, back in 2022. Kristen won it in FBO, and Ricky beat uh, Matty O, Isaac Robinson, and Chris Dickerson by three strokes to win it. So uh, both of those players have had a lot of success here. And uh, we know, of course, uh, you know, Chris Dickerson is somebody who's had a lot of success here. Isaac Robinson has played really well here. And um, Missy Gannon has played well here. Holland in more recent times own uh, kind of the names you might expect. So here we go. Josh's picks first up in FPO. In the three spot, he's got Missy Gannon. Uh, in the two spot, he's got Holland Handley, and he's got Kristen to take it down. Uh, so no big surprise there. Uh, you know, the way Holland's been playing this season, and you look how she did here last year uh, at Worlds, she finished third. Makes a lot of sense. You know, her game has continued to improve. And at times, she's looked like the best player of this season. And uh, that's been sporadic, but uh, it it has, we've seen the glimpses so, uh, but of course, she's got Kristen to win. She's just got a ton of success here. I think it makes a lot of sense. I'm matching him with that. I'm taking Kristen to take it down. I also have Holland in second place, but I'm going to take Evelina in third place. Uh, it's kind of hard to do comps with Evelina. She played well here in 2022, I think. Um, I'm trying to remember if I... No, I don't know. I, maybe she didn't even play in 2022, but last year at World, she, she played well. Uh, but of course, her putting was in a completely different place than it is right now. And we, you know, she's coming off the world championships win. She got to go celebrate. Could be a spot for a little bit of a uh, flat uh, performance. But I'm going to roll with Evelina and just the um, tremendous job she's been doing uh, off the tees and in the fairways. And I'm going to put her on my podium. Josh for MPO is going Ricky in the three spot, Isaac in the two spot, and he's got Gannon Burr taking it down. Uh, hard to argue with anybody picking Gannon Burr right now. Gannon played well here in 2022. He was five shots off the lead, finished in sixth place. Um, and uh, last year at Worlds, he was also in sixth place, and he was also five shots off the lead. So we know he's capable of putting together a good tournament uh, up in Vermont. But uh, is this the year that he gets over the hump and actually takes it down? Josh says yes. I say no. I actually don't even have him on my podium. I've got Chris Dickerson in the three spot, who's just been somebody who always seems to play well at these courses. I've got Ricky in the two, probably the most successful GMC player in MPO over the years. Uh, but I've got Isaac getting another win here at GMC. Uh, his game is just locked in right now. And I know you know he, he just lost big to Gannon at the rip, uh, but I, I don't really think that that was a story so much about Isaac's play. I think it was just a story of how great Gannon played that weekend. Could Gannon keep it going? Sure. But Isaac has been dialed in in Smugs. So I'm going to go with him to get another win, keep this season interesting. Uh, but uh, we'll see if Gannon can uh, make it a, you know, truly a historic season with another win here. Uh, it would be his seventh of the season. So those are the picks. They're in the books. We'll be back with you on Sunday for a rapid react show live inside the circle in our discord for all of our Ulti World Disc Golf subscribers. Just go to discgolf.ultiworld.com slash subscribe to join up and get into the discord. Join us for our live shows and get all of your own private RSS feed for all of our past history of uh, bonus sub bonus pods. So that's going to do it for this edition of The Upshot. For Josh Mansfield, I'm Charlie Eisenhood signing off and saying we'll talk to you Sunday on the Rapid Reacts right here on The Upshot. <laughs>